thanks for inviting me again. Um, so, uh, I just wanted to say I was, I was really excited to see this paper actually, because, um, I have a confession to make. I was 1 of the respondents. Uh, I don't think it was supposed to be 1 of the respondents, but since I saw the study, I've been waiting to see what the results were. Um, so, so this was really fascinating. Um, and hopefully, you know, 1, 1 set of bad results was insufficient to, uh, <laughs> to make it the case that all neuroscientists are unclear <laughs> about the concept. Okay, so, um, so I'm really sympathetic to the idea that the concept of representation might be polysemous in these areas that there might be, and that there might be really problematic equivocation uh, between different concepts of representation. Um, but that's not, that's not really where you're going with this, right? So it seems like in the paper, you're not really arguing that there are a bunch of different uh, notions where there's equivocation. You're, you're really saying something like, uh, there's, there's one notion like people don't know how to use it, don't know what it's good for. Uh, and, you know, we should really do something about this. So I wanted to maybe present a couple of alternative hypotheses. Um, both uh, for the interpretations of the specific experiments and sort of um, in the overall picture. So I, I think one thought might be, uh, you know, there is this sense in which representation is crucial for cognition as a theoretical posit. And that's the sense which is driving the first set of responses where they say, yes, uh, cognition requires postulating representations. Uh, but that's different from the very low key sense in which it just means evoked in somewhat specific activations. And that's the sense that you you end up asking about um, in all of the studies. So I think the fact that um, that the respondents are somewhat reluctant to say that um, something is or is not a representation in the actual studies might actually show that they're kind of sensitive um, to the difference here, that they're they're sensitive to the um, to sort of the complexity of the concept and they think, you know, merely seeing uh, specific evoked activations uh, that are that result in further activation of some larger functional network isn't yet sufficient for me to tell whether this thing that's being measured in the brain uh, is really a representation in this uh, more demanding functional sense of a representational posit. So, so if someone were sensitive to that distinction, then that might explain. Uh, why they're unwilling to commit to whether something is a representation or not, or whether an intentional characterization is appropriate or not um, in the studies. Okay, so uh, that's the first question. Um, should I let you answer or should I just keep going? It's up to Edward. Okay, I'll keep going. So, uh, so then on to the specific studies, um, here are some alternative interpretations. So, uh, so I think you say in response to study one that uh, it demonstrates that Neuroscientists don't have any idea about the scale of the vehicles that they're concerned with. Um, right that they, they, they're not strongly committed about whether representations are found at the neural scale or rather at the larger brain area scale and so on. But I guess I, I think that, you know, often uh, people think that fMRI and neural recordings are both imperfect, but ultimately getting at the same underlying physical substrate or vehicle. And so they don't they don't have to distinguish between them. Because it's really going to depend on a bunch of other information, like, is it a population code? Can you see that population code in the fMRI? Uh, is the, are the particular neurons that you are recording from representative of that representative? Are they a good sample of that population um, that's involved in doing the representation? So I don't, I don't think it means that they have no idea about what the vehicles are, but they might think that uh, merely having these recordings is, in, is insufficient to tell you whether uh, it's the it's an ad, it's the right vehicle or not for the representation they have in mind. Uh, for the second study um, about sensitivity, I, I think this one's actually quite interesting because recently in neuroscience there's been uh, a bunch of literature about mixed selectivity neurons. So uh, especially out of Lisa Giacomo's lab, where uh, where you know they've discovered that there are lots of cells that have sort of interestingly complicated response profiles. So these are neurons that care about uh, the differences between different kinds of stimuli, but they don't have like a sort of one hot response where they only respond to one thing and not to everything else. And I think a neuroscientist might think, okay, well, you know, something could exhibit mixed selectivity, uh, but still play the same kind of functional role as something that only responds to one thing, as long as it's activated in concert with a bunch of other mixed selectivity cells. 
uh, together, the total response profile could distinguish between all the stimuli that uh, the system might care about. And I, I, I think to the extent that psychologists aren't, you know, thinking about that as frequently just because of the nature of the tasks and the recordings that they do, maybe that's less salient to them, although I don't think they would disagree in principle. Um, for study three, uh, I was thinking that maybe being embedded in a larger network uh, isn't exactly equivalent to has a function. Uh, partly because I think the presumption is going to be that most things that we find in the brain do have a function, uh, whether we can directly characterize it or not. So maybe uh, having the explicit, you know, it's embedded in a larger network uh, isn't enough of a difference maker in that case to elicit different responses. And then finally, for study four, uh, I, this was the only one that I, I really felt strongly troubled by. So uh, there's this claim um, in your discussion that uh, their concept of representation must be confused because they don't care about misrepresentation. Like you say, they, they fail to distinguish natural science and representations. Um, and I guess I was thinking in this case, uh, it seems quite reasonable that it might instead reflect empirical uncertainty about whether that activation is supposed to react only to houses, or rather whether it's a mixed selectivity cell, in which case it's not misrepresenting, it's just you know only partially representing. It's giving you something disjunctive. And Actually, uh, I guess the next point on this is uh, maybe this is actually evidence that the concept has specialized to some degree. Um, so if someone is really reluctant to say uh, that something is misrepresenting and furthermore, they really only want to say that there's information being carried or uh, there's some kind of causal correlation going on, then it might mean that their notion of representation really does play a different role for them than it does for philosophers. Right? Maybe they just want to employ a notion of representation that's more lightweight, that doesn't require misrepresentation, that is basically interchangeable with this idea of um, causal activation or uh, specifically evoked activation. Um, and you know, I don't think that means that they're confused. I think that means they have a different concept from the concept that you're asking them about. And if you're consistently asking them about a concept that isn't uh, one of the concepts that they're using, then the responses you'll get, you know, will kind of be on the wrong axes uh, to come out cleanly and will look confused, even if actually their, their use is quite consistent. Okay, so that, those are the questions about the specific studies. Um, and then I guess more sort of big picture questions. Um, you say that we need reform or elimination, but I guess, First of all, there's sort of the question of the practicalities of enforcing such a change in usage. I feel like scientists respond very poorly um, when people tell them how to talk and they'll say things like, I don't care about the words, like we know what we're talking about. Um, and I, I guess I was thinking, you know, what if instead we just had a taxonomy that disambiguated all the different uses? You know, sometimes people mean vehicles, uh, sometimes they mean content when they talk about representation. Sometimes they mean something like a representational scheme, like when they're talking about representational similarity analysis. And, and sometimes they mean the theoretical posit that plays the crucial functional role in explaining cognition. I think there are lots of different uses. These are just some of them. And if we could just make people be clear about which one they mean, maybe we could avoid some of the, some of the problems that come with the concept uh, without having to eliminate it or settle on a single prescriptive usage of the term. Um, so I guess I was wondering what you think about the practicality of that, um, whether it would actually resolve the issues that you're concerned about. Um, so, you know, uh, you give an example of a fruitless debate uh, that's that that you say is caused by misuse of the um, notion of representation. Uh, I, I don't think you mentioned this in the talk, but in the paper you talked about Kiefer and Polemuller, uh, where. Um, there's this question about whether activations in perceptual motor areas uh, you know, are really activations of the concepts. And I guess in that case, it seems like you know, maybe that debate could reduce to a debate not about representational status of those activations, but just about um, whether those activations are causally relevant or not in that task where uh, concepts are being called up. Right? It seems like they could decide that debate just by looking at causal relevance uh, without having to invoke this richer notion of representation beyond uh, causal activation. So, uh, so I, I'm, I'm really curious about other examples of fruitless debates, and in particular, debates that couldn't be settled by just disambiguating uh, different uses.
Okay, I, ha I have a bunch more questions, but maybe I'll. Thank, thank you very much. I am, I'm sure you have other questions, but we came back later, so we can start with this. Thank you, man. Eduardo, Luis. Luis, do you want do you want to uh, to get going? Uh... Yeah, you can you can you can answer now, and uh, and uh, that's probably the best solution. Um, so, Eduardo. Yeah, Eduardo, you want to yeah. go? Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm happy to go first, but I'm so happy to, uh, to, defer, to defer to you. It's, it's one of the issues when you're giving a talk with a quote, <laughs> who is going to talk when? <laughs> so, uh, I, I think this is really a, a, great, uh, a great set of, uh, of, of questions, many of these uh, concerns both about the specific studies and about um, 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 uh, the whole of the project uh, is actually, uh, I, think, I think it to be quite, uh, quite uh, reasonable. But let me just uh, say a few things about some of the points you, you've made. So I think what, you, what you're proposing both as a general interpretation of the result and also for some, some of those interpretation of some of the studies is what we could call an epistemic interpretation. So the issue there is that it's not that neuroscientist concept isn't clear, it's that they just don't have enough evidence in that specific instance to apply the, the concept. They're, not, they're just not told enough. So they just say, well, I don't know enough to be able to tell you whether it's a representation or not. Um, and I think that's, uh, uh, you know, it's totally possible indeed that what it is happening, we can't really just exclude it on the basis of the data we have. On the other hand, I think it's also fair to notice that in the very paper that we model our studies on, they're not shy at all with the same type of data to call that representations. Somehow it's true about their work without more evidence than what we're giving, just correlation between stimuli and brain activation without any further evidence. They're totally happy to call that for presentations. Right? So uh, maybe, maybe suddenly, you know, the stakes becoming high, they think they're somewhat looking on the over the shoulder, they become super, super self-aware. Yeah. Uh, however, elsewhere, they're totally happy to go for a representational talk with exactly the same type of evidence. You know, think about early work on FFA. Totally put everything put on representational terms. Uh, you yeah, know, think so about... I think this is one of those cases of uh, of equivocation that's really bad that you highlight, right? There's the there's the sense in which they're totally happy to use the term where it's just activation. That's the sense in which it shows up everywhere in the paper and also in FFA. And then there's like the, oh, someone's really asking me about it and looking over my shoulder and uh, now but, I'm anxious about the notion. Yeah, no, but I wouldn't put it in terms of equivocation. I don't think there's any equivocation. I think that's exactly the way words which are unclear work. I think it's exactly when you take a work, you don't know what it means. You're using it throughout. And then suddenly you ask, well, what does it mean? And then suddenly you draw a blank. Information is yet another of these words. People talk about describe it as a brain category. You know better than anyone else, uh, carrying you know carrying information and all those kind of things, and you can precisify this notion if you want, and some people are able to do it. Other people are totally happy to use this, this tool without any idea about what they really mean by doing so. So I don't think it's a matter of equivocation. I think it's actually uh, a characteristic of empty terms that people are very happy to use this notion until they get put under the spotlight, and then the summary. Oh, dude, I don't know what that means. I don't know when I'm allowed to use this word. Uh, so, you know, and, and so I, I, I don't think we have, we have any strong evidence of equivocation. The fact that they're willing in some contexts and not other is not an evidence of equivocation. It's also, I mean, more exactly, it could be either or both, right? It could be there's actually two sensors, or it could be like it's actually an empty term. And uh, they just, when they're put under the spotlight, uh, some others wonder what that what that really means. Um, um, I mean? Yeah. So um, what, you know, one one thing you know to build first. Thank you, Ross. I appreciate the comments. Have been very uh, helpful already. Uh, I've been taking like a lot of crazy notes on everything you said. Um, so you know, one thing is that what Edward and I were hoping to do was not to get. Uh, participants to have a chance to reflect on what they think they mean about the term and then and then respond in that way, but to elicit their responses in the way that they would use it in this setting. And I know it's it, you know it's hard to do in this kind of like very 
artificial Qualtrics survey, you know, but, but, you know, the worry is to, I, I might, you know, slightly disagree with the idea of putting them on the spot. Um, I think they were just given a chance to just kind of use the term and do they agree with the term or not, as opposed to having a chance to reflect upon the term and that if they had a chance to reflect upon the term more and have to maybe like type out their definition of the term, maybe that would have caused some more um, of this kind of issue of feeling on the spot. So I just wanted to uh, elaborate on that and see what uh, you and Edward might think about that. I, I think anecdotally, uh, you know, uh, my neuroscientist friends, when they say representation around me, they, they now kind of flinch and they're like, okay, maybe I shouldn't use that word, but I'm going to use it anyway. And, and I, I do think that because of the order in which uh, your questions were asked, uh, there, like the initial thing, like, is it absolutely necessary for explaining cognition? I think evokes this uh, notion of representation that is a little bit stronger than just you know, evoked activation. So I, I think that might have set up some kind of conflict. But this is, you know, total speculation. I have no idea. And I don't think I want to argue that all neuroscientists are paragons of conceptual clarity. Like that seems that seems unlikely. Uh, but but it it seems like there are alternative interpretations still. I do think that when you, you know, in QA, when you ask like what do you really mean by representation in cases where people are using it, you know, with total profligacy, uh, people will say, oh, I, you know, all I mean is activation because they feel like confident that that's something they can back up on the basis of the experimental data. And then like anything more than that is going to require, you know, speculation or hopefulness and they're, they're less willing to commit to that in writing. I, I think they say that because they don't have anything else to say. And I think all the use of color representation in their text suggests it's not right. Uh, you know, if you do NSA, if you do um, uh, uh, adaptation fMRI, if you do MVPA to study representation, it just can't be the case that representation just means evoked activation because it's a much narrow, narrow uh, understanding of what representation must be such as this method I would have to study that. You know, even, if, even in the case of adaptation fMRI, you have the decrease in the ball signals with the second stimulus. But, you know, you have evoked adaptation in the other, you have a, a reaction in the other case, but you take only one of them to be a representational, not the other. Right? So, so it's, not quite, it's not quite right that, um, 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 you know, it, when they use a paper, or, or maybe you want, oh, sorry, or maybe you want to say that in those users, it's, it's a more ambitious concept that they have in mind. But what is that concept that they have in mind in that case? Yeah, I guess I was thinking the more ambitious concept is something that plays a particular functional role. It's like one of the underlying posits that explains complex behavior and so on. Uh, and then, you know, it's it's a it's a further empirical hypothesis that the particular activations we're measuring actually play that functional role. And, you know, you might just go ahead and like talk as if you've satisfied that empirical assumption. Uh, when writing the paper, but then when someone pushes you, you realize that you haven't, and you say, "Oh, what I really meant was just the activation." But, but I agree that the alternative interpretation is also possible. Cool, uh, Marco and Fabrizio. Uh, how shall we uh, proceed? Shall we keep going, or shall we open the floor to further discussion? Uh, I was hoping I was hoping to respond to one other thing that Rosa said. Um, yeah, maybe we can uh, we can go until uh, for for five minutes and then we'll open uh, the Q and A and then we come back if there are uh, other questions. I'm sure that there are other replies. And yeah, as you, can, as you can see, a lot of notes too. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so five yeah. minutes, then we'll open it. So still four minutes, Luis. Okay. okay. Um, Rosa, so you said some, one of the last things you said, and I was like, yes. Exactly. Um, you said maybe we need a taxonomy of the way that the term is used. And, you know, we say in these cases, representation means this, in these cases, represent representation means that. And so actually, my fist pump was a half pump. My first pump was we need a little bit more clarity on when these terms are used, but it was not a full pump because then I want to say, why not just use the other terms instead? So, if representation means that it's about, in this case, if representation means it's carrying information in this case, if, you know, it's, a, it's encoding in this case, 
why not just, you know, why put your readers through hell of having to read um, a dictionary or glossary? Uh, you know, it said representation superscript one, representation superscript two, and, you know, and so on. And why not just say encode about carries? Um, I think that would make everyone happier. Um, yeah, what, what do you think? Uh, what do you think about is that more of what you were kind of getting at? Or I'm curious what you think about. Yeah, my response. I mean, I totally agree with that. I've I've gone through this exercise m myself with a bunch of papers where I've just like gone through and tried to replace all the uses with the disambiguations with like a single disambiguation and usually it doesn't work for a single one, but it works for one or two. And I agree if we could get people to do it, uh, it would be great if we could just replace, you know, all instances of representation with evoked activation. Uh, I, I just don't understand. Don't know how how you're going to get people to do it. Yeah, I, like, I think it's just I, practical, I, but I totally agree with you. If we could have all the disambiguations and have people substitute, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, and, and it, this is why exactly why, um, you know, Edward and I are pushing that it's more that it's unclear and confused than it's just, you know, equivocation or, you know, polysemic. So we have this example in the draft paper that we sent around where in one paper, um, the, the following terms are all used by the same authors. Uh, different spatial representations, low dimensional representation, and members represent at high T, schematic representation, well represented. And it, it's like, how is it being used in those different ways? And then how do we compare that use to another paper? How would we know in another paper if that's, you know, exactly what the other people, you know, what the other people meant? So. Um, went through that list of examples actually because because I thought it was a really interesting selection of quite different uses and I, I do think that in context uh, people would be able to distinguish and be, would be able to give quite clear explications of what each of those meant um, and I can send you an email later about what I think the most charitable interpretations are uh, but but yeah I you know we're good at this as language users we're good at distinguishing subtly different uses of words um, so even if it does sometimes lead to confusion, I think often people are okay with it. Yeah, uh, I, 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 would, I would love to continue via email, but I'll, I'll, I'll let Edward, yeah. I'm, I'm very skeptical of that name. I think actually there's a lot of weasel words that, that I use in science, uh, words that are part of the way scientists talk, uh, that scientists have no idea what they mean, that scientists fill their papers uh, with uh, those words, and it's only when uh, external people, historians of science, sociologists of science, philosophers of science, poke their nose into their writing, that the emptiness of their terminology becomes salient. I think the case of Gene is a great example where until historians of science and philosophers of science start, started poking their nose and say, what does that exactly mean that you're calling a gene a gene? It became quite clear that there were 20 plus notion of, of gene floating around. Concept of innateness is a great example. Until philosophers of science started poking around and say, "What do you mean by innate?" It became just 80 notions of innateness <laughs> floating around. So the idea that that scientists are very savvy and uh, strikes me as uh, again and again uh, challenged by the uh, work in history of science and philosophy of science. I think actually science is full of empty words that scientists are very happy to use without having any idea what they mean. Uh, and I think representation is exactly one of those. Uh, uh, it does not mean that it can't be clarified. And indeed, you, you, you propose a very natural clarification. It just means evoked activation. OK, that's fine. Uh, that's one clarification. Um, but somehow, that's not the one they seem to be willing to stick with when they do their when they use the word in most of their writing. Uh, and what else they might mean when they don't mean that is, I think, a total mystery. And I think that's, that's not an accident that the, the things they grab for is evoked activation, the simplest things they could tell you. The ones they're very confident, causal relation, informational relation to characterize the, as a, um, a brain word relation. That's something that, that's totally meaningful. They know what it means. Anything beyond that, I'm still waiting for useful characterization of what that might mean coming from neuroscience. Um, and, you know, yeah, I, I, I won't go, I won't name names, but I think some of the efforts done by some neuroscientists to clarify what they mean are less than helpful. Uh, 
Okay, so <laughs> luckily we just have one official discussion this time because the, the discussion is very lively. So, and we've already have uh, five questions booked. So the first one was by Francis who uh, wrote um, on a chat. So uh, Francis, can you? Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. Good to see you. Good to hear you. Uh, yes. Uh, good, good to hear you. Uh, thank you, Edward and, and Luis, for this uh, really interesting work. Um, so I've been arguing for years that uh, neuroscientists and, and computational psychologists' use of uh, represent, the representational idiom, representational talk, should not be taken at face value. That uh, they don't. They typically don't have in mind a full-blooded notion of intentionality that philosophers are, are, are familiar with. Um, I, would, I would draw a different conclusion, though, than you do. So I think that they often do have in mind, as, as, as Rosa has, has pointed out in her work, uh, something, and that's supported by, by, by your results, that they've got in mind something much thinner, something like thinner in one sense, at least in its implications, uh, causal activation or carrying information, and so on. Um, the conclusion that I would draw, though, is that they're not confused, but rather I think that philosophers need to be more careful in finding empirical support for their pet theories of content. Um, I think that's more the worry than 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 the idea that uh, that 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 uh, the neuroscientists are, are equivocating. So what I've been more concerned with is trying to sort out what roles representational talk is in fact playing when, when cognitive scientists use it. And I think it's serving a, a number of uh, pragmatic purposes. And so eliminating it would, uh, would lose those functions. So I, I, I do think we need to be careful on, you know, to try to sort out what functions it's serving. And I think those are important functions. Now, we, there might be some disagreement about that. So we might wonder, uh, if it's, if it's really just uh, causal activation or something in that neighborhood, how come, I mean, the causal process, say, from the, just to use the, the old example of the frog uh, snapping at a fly, that's a complex causal process. Why is it, is it only typically the distal element, uh, the start of that causal sequence that's, that's identified as what is represented? Um, retinal patterns. You know, patterns on the retina are just as much a crucial part of the causal process as the fly crossing the visual field. And I think the reason is that uh, what the representational characterization does is it selects from a very complex causal process the element in that process that's particularly salient for explanations of cognition. The repeatable element, the element that supports generalizations, and the element that will support explanations of the function of this process. So it's a selection over a complex causal process. You rarely find uh, neuroscientists talking about the, inter the internal state representing patterns on the retina. And another, another function, I don't want to take up too much time, but another function, and this came up, uh, I think, in your, in your last comments, uh, Edward, is that representational talk provides a bridge back to um, the way that the explanatory target tends to be characterized kind of pre-theoretically. Very often it's in intentional terms. We want to know um, how, is the, how are we able to represent the scene. And so using representational talk, I think, enables the, the scientists to kind of tie the, the, the theory, which is typically highly complex, highly formal, back to that kind of pre-theoretic uh, target that, that we all want explained. I think there's other functions as well, but I think that eliminating the concept, um, would, we would lose kind of those import, important pragmatic functions of the talk. Yeah, I mean, uh, Louis, do you want to go first? Yeah, I think this is a um, pretty insightful, insightful point um, that uh, look, looking somehow at, at, at the pragmatic functions of, of this world. So even if we, if we think that 
uh, using representational terms to characterize the brain's reaction to stimuli does not mean um, um, assigning something beyond a causal relation to the stimuli, or maybe a causal plus functional relation to the stimuli. It's still the case that uh, um, that speech act might do something in science, uh, uh, and that might be might might, might be needed. And it, you just uh, flag two of two uh, two of two of those, um, and um, and we do we do need indeed some uh, some of these um, purposes, uh, some of these functions, pragmatic functions. Um, so I, I agree. I agree with with that, uh, and I think that, that does speak indeed against elimination. Um, of course, elimination, as I've always thought of, is a matter of cost and benefits. So that would be costs. Uh, I suppose benefits might be eliminating some confusion, some uh, unresolvable or unending controversies going on in the field. Um, but the, the functions themselves really need should be taken into account when one is trying to assess which way to go clarifying or, or reforming and um, uh, uh, eliminating. So I'm, I'm very sympathetic actually to uh, choose to your, to your push for um, it's a, it's a greater sensitivity to the way these notions happen to be used uh, in, the, um, uh, in, the, in the scientific context. Um, and what, what functions they might they might have beyond what philosophers might have so their obvious function was. Um, so that's, that's a very, very helpful point. Louis, do you want to add something? Yeah, um, I, um, I'm a little less sympathetic to the point because I think this is the very issue that we are interested in. How is the term being used? And you know, and, and that includes taking the, you know, pragmatic considerations um, into account. And so, um, you know, one thing that, that, that you said that I thought was very uh, poignant was, oh, well, you know, neuroscientists don't mean this when they talk about uh, you know, the frog's retina system, you know, and, and visual system responding to the fly in the environment. They mean that. You know, what's the evidence for that? I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying I would like to know kind of what how these terms are being used in a systematic way. And I think, you know, our work that Edward did is, is very early, um, simple, not going to make the case either way, but an attempt at trying to formulate how, you know, the community is using these, these terms. Um, so, so I, I do, you know, I, I do understand, you know, as someone who practices science myself and someone who collaborates with a lot of scientists, I appreciate the importance of we have to get the work done and you have to talk to other people. And sometimes we have to use the words um, in, you know, in a certain way. Um, and so, I mean, I will use the term representation. I thought it was funny when Rosa, she caught herself uh, using representation, a representation type word to talk about representation. She was like, it represented. And she was like, oops, you know, so like, I, I get it, you know? And so I think there's an interesting project to understand how the term is used in that way. But, you know, if we want to get more, I think, um, I don't know, I, I don't know if I want to dare say ontological about it. What are they referring to? What, what, you know, the nature of the systems that these words are attached to? I, I think we need a little bit more, more work on that, but that's, that's just speculative. Um, at this point. But yeah, yeah, I'm happy to have feedback or more to elaborate on what I said. Can I, yeah, I mean, I, can I respond yeah, to uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, to say, to say uh, uh, one thing, Frank, in addition to that. I mean, I, I think one of the worry with using representation is the one you're very sensitive to, I think, of all people, is that it breeds misunderstanding in the, um, in the listeners, right, during the communication. Because even if you write about that, it really fulfills those functions, it often carries some, some sort of additional implicit commitments that you always should remind yourself. No. <laughs> you should always have your Frankie in the back of your mind. No, it's not that. It's something else. <laughs> so that's that's a sort of a worry, maybe. With uh, I suppose an elementalism, I try to push back to what you're saying. saying but what about the uh, tendency to just read more than what we should be? Anyway, you wanted to respond, Frankie. So go for it. Yeah. Th thank you, Edward. And I, I agree. I, great last comment. Uh, 
but I want to just respond to Luis that I think the empirical work is commendable. Uh, I think it's really important to try to figure out what commitments uh, scientists have in using, in, in using the terminology that they use. It's just, it's, what I'm objecting to is the conclusion that they're confused and that elimination is, is, a, is a plausible way to go from there. But I think the empirical work is, is, is really interesting. And thank you for it. It's, uh, it's uh, I mean, I love it, actually. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you. I yeah, appreciate it. Thanks, Pramad, for the question and the stimulating is put. Uh, we have now two further questions. So please, uh, David Coraci, uh, can you unmute him, Fabrizio? Yeah, okay. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the very interesting talk and the many ideas. Rose and um, well, my probably my my, my concern uh, partially overlaps with the, the last one and uh, some points uh, uh, by Rosa Caos, but sorry for that. Um, um, let me let me say okay um, and um, well, I see your 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 proposal as sort of uh, conceptual engineering, okay, uh, uh, about the the concept of of representation or at least mental representation, okay. And uh, um, if this this way, uh, one one thing that always we say, uh, um, word me about this this proposal is the sort of commitment that these approaches have uh, to the let's say, distinction between a descriptive level and a normative let's say level. So how to argue that given that uh, someone uh, incorrectly use uh, the, the this notion, this concept, then we should reform or even eliminate this concept, uh, and so let's say uh, um, argue in favor of some normative claims. Okay, about how to use that concept, how it should be used this concept. So my my question was in general is to, uh, to the fact that in, say the possibility that uh, your proposal is involves with the involves uh, this kind of normative claim about. The, the notion of representation, uh, whether it is the case or, or not. Thank you. I, I think I, I, I can answer first. Uh, you know, I mean, in uh, the last chapter of my uh, book, uh, for the reasons probable, that's really what I kind of talk about in how the descriptive part of empirical analysis and the normative part are, are supposed to be connected to one another. So yes, I mean, for me, the project is, is of course, normative, and I think for Louise as well. Um, and indeed the idea is once we get a handle on some of this notion, now I think Louis and I are totally willing to say it's more complicated than what we say, it's really a first pass and uh, much, you know, um, but once we get a handle on, on some of these notions, then we sh it brings to the fore normative questions, right? So here's a possible result we could have, we could have found. All the manipulation might have been significant, might have worked, and people might have been willing to assign misrepresentations of false studies. Would have been, would have been totally, it's a possible outcome, right? There might have been possible, yes, uh, neural event misrepresent a house as a face. Yes, when you've got more higher sensitivity, you're more likely to represent, the so neural event is more likely to be a representation. Yes, when there's evidence of a functional role, you're more likely to assign representational status. And yes, it's more likely to be detected at the level of population of neurons and the level of um, um, uh, ephemeri. Uh, forgetting about, uh, you know, uh, uh, Rosa's point about the connection between these two, these, these two levels uh, here. That would be an interesting outcome. In that case, uh, some of the normative question would have been much less salient. We would have seen here neuroscientists happen to have a somewhat clear commitment with respect to how, this use, this use, this, how to use these words. And uh, they seem to draw important distinction between natural signs and representations. And then I would have backed off uh, from, uh, in a sense, uh, being attracted to the normative question. So what, what to do with that notion? Now, that's not what we found. And the fact that we failed to find any of these possible outcomes, I think, makes the normative question salient. Now, how to answer the normative question is far from being clear. And I think the discussion we had earlier with uh, Frankie has actually brought 
some of the complications uh, in uh, issues about elimination to the surface that any scientific world, in addition to its uh, um, what, what might call ontological commitments, maybe uh, also has pragmatic uses, um, and those are also important uh, uh, in, in in science, and as they should be taken into consideration in debates about reform versus elimination or clarification versus elimination. So, um, um, so how to proceed once we agree that there's a, there's a salient pragmatic question is really um, an open question, and uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's debated in conceptual engineering. There's a long tradition around Carnap about how to try to do that, and so on and so forth. Um, so, I would be slightly moving the discussion to a new, to a different direction. Louis, you want to add something? Yeah, no. that's good. Yeah, uh, it was uh, actually kind of a clarification um, for Davide. Um, are, are you asking how we view our work as taking some descriptive uh, facts that we've, we've discovered and then the normative claims that follow from that in terms of um, how we think representation should be used or not so the elimination question or is it that you think we're trying to understand normatively what representation means how it should be defined that was a little bit unclear on uh, what you meant by the role of um, normativity in our work yeah if I okay um, no my question was about the fact that um, um, okay uh, it happens okay in philosophy generally that uh, um, why um, when someone um is okay uh, let's put it with, with a metaphor the fact that we we um, do not reason in a deductively valid way okay from these facts it doesn't follow that we we should uh, uh, let's say eliminate logic and uh, uh, deductions so there is always let's say this problem from the fact that uh, people uh, do not use a certain a certain say formally well 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 defined um, i don't know uh, schemas or, 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 or concepts or or uh, um, reasoning okay kind of reasoning uh, from this fact doesn't follow that we should uh completely dismiss that that, that reason so there is I, I think always this 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 balance between the um, to understand they say the descriptive analysis of something so the empirical work the the, the evidence you have about this this phenomenon okay that is uh, probably correct and then probably let's say correctly um capture some 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 aspects okay in how the com different communities use the, that concept that is unclear that is uh, problematic and so on but then from that that point to the uh, normative claim to the fact that uh, we should uh, revise this definition, provide uh, an if and only if, let's say, definition of what uh, representation is. That there is always this gap, let's say, between the two the two levels. I, I think that I mean that is something that should be should be uh, say investigated and should argue in that that this this direction. Say. I yeah, thanks for yeah. Yeah, a, a quick response, if if any, or no response, if you prefer. It I, I more wanted a clarification, uh, but I think Edward might have a response. Um, I have a, I'm psychic and I could read him sometimes. I mean, I, I think there's a bit of a um, um, amb ambiguation, uh, yeah, uh, fallacy of ambiguation between two different things. So uh, when people make mistakes, for example, probabilistic mistake, you know, the Kahneman style, we don't reform the principles of probability theory. When people fail to apply modus ponens properly, we don't change uh, the rules of classical logic and so on and so forth. But that's not really what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is reforming the, what people do, right? So when people make a mistake in, probab in probabilistic reasoning, we do change their reasoning. We ask them to reason better. When people fail to apply modus tollen, modus ponens or modus tollens, we do ask them to reason better. That's actually why we teach critical reasoning uh, at, at the university. At least that's what, what we hope <laughs> to do. Uh, whether we're successful is another matter. Uh, so, so the, the suggestion here is not so much that we need to change the norms, right? That's not really what we're proposing. What we're proposing here 
is to change what people actually do. And I don't think that's controversial at all. We always do that, or often do that. Uh, you know, uh, it's a bit more complicated. Sometimes you change the norms when you find the way people reason. There's a symbol of historical events. So, so it's, a, it's a bit more complicated than what I'm suggesting here. But, but we're not suggesting that we must change the norms in light of what people do. We're suggesting we must change what people do. And I think that's much less controversial than what you are actually suggesting. Thank you very much. So, we, we have no time for a follow up, Davide, because we have uh, John and Zina's questions too. So we welcome John Sky's questions. Fabrizio, can you please unmute him? Welcome, John. Uh, great. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. I'll try to keep the question as brief as possible. So, I wondered to what extent you think that the use of representations in neuroscience is still grounded on a kind of classical substance dualism, because it seems that's what represent is supposed to do, right? Because the res cogitans and the res extensa are substantially different for the mind to understand anything else, it has to be represented, kind of the logic has to be transferred. And if that is the case, and, and perhaps it's not, but if that is the case, maybe a strategy then would be to point out that it is grounded on a kind of an old Cartesian dualism, which isn't so popular in the sciences anymore. So I guess there's two questions. Is that still a major factor in the use of representation in the neurosciences? And uh, what might be a, a strategy um for for encouraging people to to rethink thank you Louis, go fight. Uh, yeah i have a, a brief response which is um I, I think we can't even maybe we can't even get to the question of mind body dualism until that's kind of you know part of the point is we don't understand what representation means how it's being used and so it's tough to see how it would relate and connect to um, those issues. So I like uh, Barbara Montero, um, some of her work, she talks about, you know, not the mind-body problem, we're not even there yet. There's the physical problem, how do we define the physical? And then we can talk about the mind-body problem. Um, and, and so in this case, you know, um, I have a hard time understanding how representations are material or immaterial. I need to kind of understand more what the word means. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay, thanks for the question. We still have uh, another one from Zina. Welcome. Well, you're always welcome, Zina, but welcome here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks uh, <laughs> for the uh, really interesting talk and Rosa, um, fantastic comments. Um, uh, my original question was actually, I think, asked by Frankie, but just to put a slightly different spin on it, it, it strikes me that the Rheinberger can be read as rationalizing or as explaining conceptual ambiguity, right? Why? Why is gene a useful useful concept despite its ambiguity? And also, why do, do does the use of concepts persist despite ambiguity? Right. And so I was just wondering. I think Frankie was more pushing on like you know there might be pragmatic uses that rationalize the conceptual ambiguity of representation. I was also wondering like what's the error theory? <laughs> like what why has this concept been so incredibly you know ubiquitous if if your critiques are right? And then the the small small point also I just wanted to make I think following up on Rosa's strong reaction to study four um, in your comment I think in response to the comment before last you said you know if we had found in study four that um, they were willing to ascribe misrepresentation such that a house is misrepresented as a face something like that um, then you would be, would have been satisfied I just wanted to point out to me that would have been really problematic <laughs> because that would have suggested they would they were willing to say that it was misrepresenting a house as a face, but in line with the other studies, they weren't willing to say that it was representing a face. So how could it be, right? <laughs> um, so it, my worry about study four is just sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't. No, no response there would have would have been fully coherent. Yeah. So I, I, I just, you know, you're, you're quite right about study four. I, so it would have been nice if. <laughs> So just having a positive reason for study four, like news of misrepresentation, but no, no, uh, no relevant, no coherent result for the other one would have been really damning. I agree with you. I just had in mind that somehow they would have been willing to use the word representation in a in a coherent manner in the previous one and use the notion of misrepresentation there. Uh, so that's what I had in mind. Not not, not just one separated from the other. Uh, and 
I just want to say a few things about the error theory question. It's a really good question. Uh, and, and the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> uh, it is a, it is a really, really, really good question. So why is, so I don't have a, I haven't even thought about it. So I don't have a, a theory of why somehow the notion of representation has become so hung on if, um, if, uh, we are true that if it's true that the word is just an empty way of of talking that somehow does not hurt too much because it, it can always be, ca be cashed out as what I was saying in terms of in causal terms or informational terms. Um, why why has it been so important? You know, and it's 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 a good question. You can always give a historical explanation. You know, uh, historical paradigms coming from. The 1960s get um, uh, at the root of, um, you know, they, they get entrenched, as Wimsat would love to say, in the theoretical apparatus of, of sciences, and they survive their users or their usefulness. Right? Um, so that could be an explanation, but that's really a good question. And I'm just, in a sense, here um, grabbing for a possible type of story I could I could tell you rather than seriously committing myself to uh, to uh, to any story. Uh, you know, uh, on the other hand, of course, you know, this will not be your theory, but someone like Frankie has a response to this question, right? So there are indeed users that are functional. Uh users of the notion of that are functional. Uh, so that's 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 that, that's providing explanation, but that's not an error theory. Um, so really good question. So I actually I don't really have much more to say than just an analogy suggests it might just be a phenomenon of entrenchment, but that's the best I can do on top of my head. Louis, do you want to do better? I don't know better, but maybe uh, alongside. <laughs> um, and I'll also respond in reverse order. So um, I so I thought um, you know the use of misrepresentation, including that question. Um, I, at least for me, was uh, some way of trying to get at the ways that philosophers paradigmatically think about representation, how we understand them, how we define them, if that's uh, found its way into the sciences. And so, as Edward said earlier, um, misrepresentation has been key to philosophical understandings of representation. And so, <clears throat> it's just an interesting question that if that's so important to philosophers of mind and cognitive science, um, how important is it or not? Um, to um, scientists. And so that, to me, that was kind of some of the motivation, but I do agree. And I think it's, it's kind of interesting and funny that it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't. So I, I do appreciate that point. Thank you. Um, in terms of um, uh, the, the, the first question, uh, along the lines of Edward's response, I'm not sure. I, you know, I view things socio-historically, and I think that this has just been entrenched in, in the way that that students get taught, um, the words that they use, maybe I'm getting a little too coony in here, but it's very normal science um, to understand using the term representation in a certain way. Um, and it pops up in books. And, and I think it takes, you know, a long time for that, for that to change. Uh, note that I, you know, I think, and I have my own biases that um, there's increasing literature um, in neuroscience, various kinds of neuroscience that don't appeal to representations. Um, so, um, there's a lot more work in control theory, applications of control theory, um, applications of, of complex systems and synergetics and different things like that, that explain um, a lot of the, um, same phenomena, um, as the computational representational approaches do, uh, but they don't use the same kind of language. Um, but yet they ground their claims in, you know, coherent stories that are grounded in, in data. And so, um, yeah, that, that, that's. Um, my response ended up probably not satisfactory, but um, do you have any any response to uh, Edward and my um, comments? Or maybe Rosa too might have a comment. She looked like she was smiling. Yeah, maybe she was <laughs> yeah, I was thinking that you know I've been defending city neuroscience weirdly uh, through this, but but actually I, I was thinking maybe you guys have been too charitable rather than insufficiently charitable in the sense that you're saying they're confused, and I think you know maybe they're not. Confused, maybe they're engaging in something like self deception or even worse, you know, other deception. Uh, because I think one of the things, I think the best 
error theory that I can come up with is that you know, the phenomena are characterized in representational terms, right? We want to explain why it is that we have thoughts and concepts and so on, uh, you know, as Frankie says. And on the other hand, we can't measure those directly. We can measure activations directly. And so it feels like we've made more progress if we assimilate the things that we can measure to the things that we originally cared about. Right, it, it sounds like we're making progress if we found representations for faces, if we found, you know, representations for value and for rules and so on. It sounds like we, you know, we've gotten somewhere. Whereas if we say we've just found activations, and then there's like a further question of how that's connected to mental phenomena, then we, then it seems much less exciting. So I, I think some of it is just marketing, and then maybe we start believing our own bullshit. Maybe yeah, we can I, all write. A, we can all. Maybe we could all write a paper called Feel Good Neuroscience, the history of the concept of representation. <laughs> I'm not sure we do it marketing, but I think your, your insight is actually quite, quite right. That there's indeed sort of a goal of understanding phenomena that have an intentional nature. And, and, and then we look at causal systems and dynamic systems. And somehow there's a gap there that, that must be somehow bridged. Uh, and it's a little bit mysterious how to, how to bridge that gap, really. And somehow just using represent the word representation seems to allow you to uh, to do that, maybe by sort of a trick. Uh, but but at least you do seem to be making. Uh, yeah, I think you do seem to be making some progress. I, don't, I think it's a bit more marketing. I think it's just it's just hard to just okay. But here here is how we would have an answer to the question we started with. Um, uh, so I, I think that's quite an insightful response, actually, connecting it not simply to the history, as I was suggesting, as we were suggesting, but also to the explanatory goal of cognitive neuroscience, uh, and why it's very tempting then to just turn to the concept of representation to just bridge that apparent bridge. I think that's really, uh, really, really, really useful and really clever, actually. Uh, and there does seem to be a kind of truth there. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, you know, why think an adaptation ephemeri tells you anything about representation? Well, you know, it's, it's after all just, just, you know, it's, it's a dynamic and causal process that you might repeat the stimulus, which I have changed just as in both signals. So it tells something maybe about the functional role of this area. All that could be put in causal terms. But somehow you have a, a non causal gloss of a on, on what the system is, is, is doing. And I think you're quite right. It might just be because of the original question you were asking, how do we have thoughts about faces? How do we recognize faces in the first place? An intentional question. Uh, yeah, this is really, really helpful. Okay, so. Maybe a nice, sorry. <laughs> uh, I was just gonna say, maybe a nicer way of thinking about it is, you, it's just that it's hopeful, right? That, you know, it's optimistic. Like maybe these are the rec representations rather than yes, this. We definitely ran out of time, so. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry to interrupt this very intense, as, as expected, uh, uh, wonderful discussion and presentation. So we um, we have still two questions, but we are running out of time. So we asked uh, um, people to send uh, um, to the speakers, to Edouard and Louise, their question by email. And we uh, take the occasion to thank again the speakers, so Edouard and Louise. Thanks, Rosa, for wonderful comments, and also thanks all the attendees for the comments. So thank you.